Something that I've always loved about the John Wick films, and I believe we spoke about it at Fantastic Fest for the first film, is just how many details there are. They're absolutely everywhere, in every frame, communicating something. The lighting can inform something about the character just as much as a yeah. missing limb or a scar or the, the whole attire. How yeah. do you keep from overwhelming yourself with all that and how much do you allow yourself to filter through your head during pre-production and production and having trust in others to hold up their lantern so to speak when needed because in a post I imagine you can just kind of take it all in and yeah. add the finishing touches yeah look I, I think if you really understand to be on a movie set and be in development for like two years there's a lot I mean I Hopefully, me and my creative team, we've gotten better over the years about how to embrace. And, you know, after John Wick 2, when we decided to open up the world in the way we did, um, it got to utilize something that we had already been trained. Like, you know, I don't want to go too far back, but like, you know, I spent, if you look at my second year or stunt quarter resume, it's kind of a heavy hitters list of directors I've been fortunate enough to work with. Mm -hmm. And to see how they work on set for whole films and see the detail and the world building and the attention to detail they put in. And then you cap that with 10 years with the Wachowskis that are probably the most detail oriented people I've ever worked with. Like out of the range of the spectral range of your vision of what colors they like detail, like tone, er everything. And um, you spend 20 years in that world. So when it's your shot, like I, I you know, I've never felt overwhelmed. I just, you know, okay, I look at you right now. Like I pretty much have most of your bookshelf behind you memorized. I got your shirt pattern memorized. I would do something with that wall behind you. I'd put in something like that with shadowing. And, you know, like I'm already thinking of what I could do to put in a little, like I put the, the Janice, the God of New Beginnings behind you. And I do this, I do a little arrow that pointed to one of the books that I really love or one of the videos behind you that I really love. And then we, you know what I mean? You could already start designing. Yeah. So I guess it's just, having worked with so many really, really, I mean, far better directors than I'll ever be, that's kind of burned into you in methodology. And plus, I get to do something that very few directors get to do. I got to do an original property for my own head that focuses on things that I love. It wasn't like just coming up with a cops and robbers thing. Like I got to make a movie about movies. Like yeah. John and were never meant to be that. Keanu and I sat down, I was like, the one thing we're not doing is I don't want to get a movie. That's a hard pitch when you sound like we're like, we're going to make a love letter to 70s films, samurai movies, cowboy westerns and all that stuff. We never thought we'd go anywhere with it. We thought we were going to go right to videos. So we yeah. kind of mess with things. And then number two and then number three. And then by the time number four goes like, OK, we're on a gag now. Like, you know, a lot of that Paris section in number four is based on Amelie. And it's good, the bad, the ugly. It's Lawrence of Arabia in the beginning. I mean, you can pick a scene. I'll tell you what it's from. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was us having fun. And if you take the amount of time and the crew that's been with us for all four, like Kevin Cabin, my production designer, he's already thinking like, he's like, where do we stick the Latin phrase? It's gonna tell him where, to, you know, there's so much detail work put in. Every word of graffiti, every, like you said, scar, every piece of jewelry was handpicked to kind of, somebody on the crew had something to say, or it's a little, at least nod to their mom or something like that. And they, that's what, when you get a crew full of people that love movies, not just to make them, but love them, it's very easy to pull these ideas together and go, well, no, like this is the gig. I'm doing my Lawrence Arabia thing. We're actually in Aqaba. What do you guys want? Like, you'll get these little ideas like, hey, Chad, you know, I, I used to love this anime. I was like, oh, you love Cowboy Bebop. I love Cowboy Bebop. Man, I like Spike. Let's put, let's do the, and you'll right. like, well, you know, I actually have a degree in Latin. You have a degree in Latin. You're putting all the Latin on the steps. What do you want to say? Like, And it becomes very fun. It keeps everybody motivated. So not only is it not overwhelming, it's inspiring. It keeps everybody coming to work on, what's he gonna do today? Like, how cookie can we be? Like, what movies do we love? Yeah. And it, it it takes the crew from doing a job to leaving a little part of themselves into the film. And I found that to be very, very effective because like when you come to set and you're doing a hundred days of nights, like you gotta keep people inspired. Um, I think people come to the John Wicks knowing that we love movies and knowing that the special sauce really isn't action or choreography. It's Keanu, who yeah. loves making movies, loves his crew. It's my cinematographer, Dan Laus. It's my production designer, Kevin Cavanaugh. It's my sound guys, Mark Steckinger. It's my editor, Nate Orlov. It, it's all these great people that truly, truly love, like 
if they weren't on set with me, they'd be geeking out over the same stuff I'm geeking out in every day at home, just going, I gotta watch more Japanese animation. I gotta watch more Korean cinema. Like they just get it. And those are the people that we spent the last 10 years surrounding ourselves with, so. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's such a, um, a musicality to your filmmaking yeah. that um, th this is a question that I've, I've asked uh, composers and, and musicians in the past, but I feel like it's somewhat relevant to what you do. And, and it's this idea of creating a simple song versus a complexly layered one. I feel <laughs> like your films, they're, they're simple songs, but it's the characters. There's yep. all these little things and that's where all the layers are. In music, it'd be phrasing or creating your bars, or, you know, your melody, your harmony, your beat track. Like, you've probably heard the stories. We start every movie with the same two whiteboards. Mm -hmm. Things we love about action movies, things we hate about action movies. Don't do that list. Try to do that list. Um, one of them is uh, plot and exposition. Like, look, I'm all for memento. I'm all for great twists and turns and reveals and all that stuff. And in the next couple films I'll do, I'll probably experiment with a lot of different ways of storytelling. Just mm -hmm. in the weeks, we knew it was supposed to be a bit more spectacle and a fable. Most fables or myths are very simple. They convey a very uh, simple but direct theme. And we just want to stay on theme. Fate, consequence, choice, love, regret, whatever it was we stayed with. You know, like, uh, we're huge. Not just the Iliad and all the stuff that we, everyone talks about, but like I love Dante. I love yeah. the, the the rings of hell and the I, you know anything that travels, right? And any good traveler, and I'm sure you've done it too. It's not just the destination; it, it's the journey, right? Like part of the adventure is the journey, and you don't want to convolute that too much. So with Wick, we're just a, a lot of a little. Um, I was told very early on by a great director that helped me. Um, Picture this, you could tell a life story of this guy about where he was brought up, where he was, you know, where he went to law school, how he fought the good fight as a lawyer, and you can make the three act thing of his life. Or you can do a whole movie about the guy you met last night in a bar that came from the half haggard with a parrot on his shoulder. Which one of those sounded more interesting to you? Because it's the character, right? It's the, right, it's right, the right. So the plot is simple. They mess with his dog, he's gonna get back. The story, however, is a man's journey through grief and vengeance, who he is and identity. And that always seemed to permeate more with me, like in what I read and what I watch, what I ground. So like, it's funny you bring up music, that's interesting. Um, I always go through it with my composers, Tyler and the guys. Um, a lot of times when you throw like, and in action movies, you've heard it, like like a heavy techno beat and they try to you know, da, 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 and really infuse right. the action with it. Funny enough, when you hear count car sounds, you know, cars are right around that middle C, you know, gunshots, pating, pating, right around that high B or C, right? So if you put music on that, they compete. Yeah. Like you're, I, I'm not listening to the music and I can't hear the sound design. So I have Tyler purposely either take out all bass tracks in action or I pitch everything up. I key everything a little higher. So there's separation. So you'll hear music, You'll hear Gustafel Steen or whatever in the Arc de Triumph, but you'll hear every single gunshot, you'll hear every single hit, and you'll hear every single rev of the engine. I put them all in different keys or octaves, right? So if you look at that, because you're clearing things out, right? You're, you're putting things that guns can hear everything at once without being confused. Now, imagine if I put everything in the same key and the same note. Yeah. And that's what usually happens with some of these bigger movies. They don't think of stuff like that. Now, if you took that same analogy to to plot and story, right? If I have a really thick plot and I'm trying to tell you a thick story, what do you think happens? You know, it's it can be confusing and they cancel each other out sometimes. So right. I think you have to keep, keep them separate. Like plot doesn't necessarily mean story. Plot is my structure, what's going on? What's the basis or what's the, the progression of the story? The story is all those little bumps, twists and turns that happens in the characters and those little moments and details. So by keeping them somewhat uh, together, but off key, so you can s definitely see each one of them, they stay out of each other's way. And I think you can be very successful. Like that. Yeah, yeah. So like, for instance, there's a scene with uh, Kane and Shimizu when they're uh, talking to each other and one of them, they're, they're trying to figure out like, 
why why are we here why are we in this situation and then when it clicks for one of them he says daughter alive he gets it that's all you need to show for us in the audience to be able to understand you let them the the history of that relationship everything but then you know i guess it's kind of flipped but uh there's a sequence earlier and maybe this is the crash of the symbol so to speak with you know uh we have guests arriving and then that's when you you know you open the the cabinets and you're showing all yeah. the weapons and then everybody okay. in the audience is kind of a little bouncing up a little bit clapping it's it so that 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 feeling that yeah. that that roller coaster that music to it it's just like there's nothing like it i'm a very visual person like when i read i see the book that i'm reading like i you know i have a writer mike finch that's very visual like that too um but a lot of people write and they just can read like you you know a book and when you read, there's a certain pace you read. It's the speed that you read at. It's how you digest it. Yeah. Like, so when you read a script, you go into reading mode. What happens in a movie theater, though, there's a there's definitely a pacing mode, right? Yeah. And, you know, it, it, and especially in our time, in our lives now, we're streaming stuff like, you know, most people are watching most of the content at home. We get up, you, you have an ADD all along, like, you can go to the bathroom, you go to the fridge. I have to sit you in a theater for nearly three hours and keep you entertained. So one of the first things you learn very quickly in directing is pacing, mm -hmm. like a little bit of roller coaster ride. Like even if it's a very simple story and a very simple plot and a very even if it's a drama, you have to give these little things that keep people amused. Now maybe that's a laugh, maybe that's a moment, maybe you make them cry, maybe you show them something different, maybe you make them question the character. But that that's really what we're talking about, right? It, it's mm -hmm. being visually stimulating throughout the movie and keeping you engaged. So pacing is one of those hidden arts that I was unaware of until I started watching. And that's where you really start discovering the movie in editorial. And the more experience you get, we start building those into the script now, knowing that, okay, we, we, we usually overwrite the scene. It's like, your daughter's fine. How's my daughter? I'm here because of my daughter. And you're just like, yeah. then you picture here, Yuki saying it going, no, all he's going to do is tilt his head and look him right in the eye and go, Oh, yeah. dude, how's Mia, your daughter? And you're like, good, okay. And then everybody knows, okay, because they've jumped ahead from, you let the audience connect the dots. That That's, now Now you're being part of the experience, right? You're not just being sit, sit down and told what the movie is. Mm -hmm. I think you have that. I think all the movies that I love, I have to participate. Like, I got to pay attention. That's one of my favorite things when I sit down with my partner now. I got to tell, like, just watch the movie. Everything you know is going to be right here, man. Just trust me. This is old school, <laughs> 70s movie. Just watch. Don't miss that beat when he puts the coffee cup down. That's the clue who, who, who killed him, right? Just watch. You know, I think we get in that mode where we're just, uh... so I think when you're in theaters, you, you got to keep people awake. You got to keep them engaged in your film. And you also have to make them part of it. I think all the great action, all the great Kung Fu movies, all the great action movies, that like the first Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm in that movie with Indy, man. <laughs> like, I'm allowed yeah. what I, you know? Um, and that's always, I think, one of the most important things of doing an action movie is can you get the audience involved and can you keep that pacing of just when you think it's done, boom, you hit the guy in the head with a tomahawk. Okay, all right, that was funny. You know, you, you got me. I thought it was over. Or like, you know, you think John Wick's falling down enough stairs and then I'll throw him down that one more time. That's that silent movie gag. You yeah. think back, like, how did Buster Keaton keep you so engaged in everything he did without one word? I mean, silent films are still fascinating yeah yeah speaking of that i really love that you have uh donnie kind of do the the wind up on one of those uh punches that's great that was uh we joked we it's just one of those things whatever in the gym whenever we didn't know what to do we just oh let's do one of these and it was kind of a joke yeah like we we're just giving each other shit. and he's like hey chad what do i do one of these because we had yeah. tried all these other fancy things and it was like yeah like it, it felt like we needed that like you play, i needed a symbol crash right and it was right. like uh, and we're like, well, he's a blind guy that apparently can pretty much fight better than a guy with sight. So we should make something kind of funny here. And Donnie goes, how would I do this? And again, me doing it right now to show you is one thing. When you see Donnie Yen do it at speed mm -hmm. after the sequence, you're like, yeah, that's going to work. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I know we're just about out of time. So I'll wrap up with this <laughs> line that I really love. And it's how you do anything is how you do everything. I I'm just curious about how ritualistic you are because from the onset of this film you know the fires on the floor the way that king's you know reciting yeah. this, this poetry um it, it just 
there's such that that's the the world building aspect that's the constant intrigue everything that's causing you to lean in and so i feel like from the beginning of doing these films you've kind of abandoned traditionalism and broke the rules so to speak yeah. and so i'm just curious at what point in your career maybe being surrounded by other filmmakers or your own absorption of film that you just felt like this is the path that i need to create for myself i think i mean that's very kind of you to to say that um i don't think it wasn't like any sort of rebellious nature i think because i had spent with dave and a few other guys you know 10 years fixing other people's stuff for studios mm -hmm. you realize how many of these mistakes like tone and pace and rhythm and why didn't they just cut here like why didn't we just get the extra shot it's because like any industry in in hollywood and, and the world over there seems to be a, a template 10 weeks prep 12 weeks shoot, 22 weeks post. You don't spend like producers, studios, line producers have all gotten this template in their accounting. Well, we can't spend that there because you do this here. And like, if anybody really looked at where the money was being spent, it, it comes into, well, every movie's different. You don't, it's like people. You can't put every single human in a template and nutrition and a fitness routine. You're gonna react to 10 pushups different than I react to 10. But like, mm -hmm. so I came up in a world of individuality training nutrition focus talent skill whatever it was we all have our things but we all learn in different ways so if you try to put every movie out there which are every bit as diverse as individuals into these templates things get dropped missed opportunities it's not movie making is organic uh, personalities are organic stories are organic like you have to give it room to grow and every every film needs that individuality approach Mm -hmm. So it could be like, maybe I don't need to like, you would be shocked about the amount of money I spend in prep. Double what even Hollywood blockbusters spend. Mm -hmm. Yet, how do I do a movie quicker, faster, better, bigger than they do? For literally 50 to 100 million less than they do it. Mm -hmm. Spending more money up front in prep. Like we just know where to put it. So it wasn't so much, we're rebelling against like, we just saw the obvious flaws in the system. Mm. And went, well, if you just paid the actors a little bit more and made them train for six weeks more, but Hollywood gets into this mode of, let's just take 10% out of every every department. Let's just, and rather than going, well, why don't we just spend more and get it right in prep and put the director's nuts to the fire and make them commit to a couple of storyboards that we all know what we're doing. And this is my favorite one. They'll pay for an entire stunt team to come in and train a cast member, one cast member, <laughs> to train for like eight weeks, but they won't pay a little bit more to rehearse with the stunt guys he's fighting with. So you're gonna rehearse with this whole group of guys all this time. And they won't bring the people that he's actually doing with. So they get down to set and basically, like what? no live show in the world does that. And then yeah. I'll do you one better. You know those guys holding those little boxes that record things? I think mm -hmm. they call them cameramen. Okay, yeah. well, they're the ones that gotta know the fight too. Yeah. Nobody brings their camp. The guys in charge of capturing your movie. Nobody brings them into like three or four days, three or four days before you start principal photography. I bring mine in weeks, if not months ahead of time to rehearse everything, to know where everything is on the truck. So bringing my crews in just even one week earlier, maybe three quarters of a million dollars more, but guess how much work I get out of it when people know all their shit. Yeah. Like, that is to this very day, happening this very day on 95% of sets around the world, they make that same mistake because they think they're saving money. And yet when you pull off 30, 40, 50 setups a day, who's, you know, and then they look at us, they call bull and what we're doing. I was like, no, I just pay really good people really well to be good. And they, guess what? They're pretty good. So yeah. it wasn't, again, it was just first identifying that there is a problem and then identifying the solutions to alleviate the problem and always knowing that like, look, the universe doesn't care about order over templates. It's always going to change and move and, you know, get people that understand that. And when you get the right producers and the right accountants and the right ADs to help schedule, you can, yes, we, people come in every show and go, what are you guys doing? And we fight every time with the new people and every time we, 
you know, I'll, not to be over arrogant, but every time we've we've kind of proven our, our way of doing things. Yeah. You know, I think that's the way you should be. You should be, um, you know, use money when you have it. When you don't have it, you have to be smart. So don't be lazy and being clever is free. So mm -hmm. that's where you should put your time, you know? Yeah. Well, you have a great head on your shoulders. Keep doing what you're doing. You have a lot of great work ahead of you, and I really just can't wait to see it. So. Uh, real quickly, I'll just say that I do a podcast with some friends and every episode, this just started someday, uh, we always try to relate to whatever we're talking about to John Wick in some capacity. It just started happening naturally and then we just made it an ongoing gag. You're going to have to send me some of those. I, I'd like to listen. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day. I can't yeah, wait and to Preston, cool you ever want anything? You ever want to talk on your show? Like Seriously, man, I'm a fan of yours as well. So uh, get in touch with David if you need anything else and we'll talk. Okay, thank you. Thanks.